Well, here we are, everybody. Last lecture video of the course. Pretty hard to believe. Lecture 9. Uh, again, the end of Unit 3 and the end of the course together. This is the third part of our Human Genetic Disorders lecture series. And today we'll be talking about predispositions that are genetically based. We'll use BRCA genes and breast cancer, as well as alcoholism of our examples. That's going to lead us to a discussion of twin concordance. We've seen twin concordance come up even earlier in the course, but we'll give it its due uh, coverage here in this lecture video. And then we'll use fetoketonuria as an example, not of a predisposition, but how are the nurture or environment of an individual can impact their genetics and give rise to a disorder uh, that is genetically predisposed in their genome. In other words, they have the makings for the disorder, but an environmental input is needed to make the disease and the symptoms manifest. But we'll start off with these BRCA genes. So individuals with two X sex chromosomes have a 1 in 7 chance, a greater than 10% chance of getting breast cancer in their lifetime, simply by being uh, biologically female. Most of this cancer is sp sporadic, meaning it arrives without a genetic basis. But 5 to 10% of the cases are genetically linked, and we see that here. Again, about 80, 70 to 80 percent of breast cancers are, again, spontaneously arising, most likely due to environmental or induced mutations. But another 5, 10 to 20 percent is genetic in one way or another, either heredity or at least being observed in family clusters. Similar rates are seen in ovarian cancer as well, where about 10 to 25 percent of ovarian cancer seems to have a genetic basis. And that genetic basis really comes down to these BRCA genes. Uh, females who inherit mutations in BRCA genes have a much, much higher risk of having breast and ovarian cancer due to those mutations. So the question becomes, what are those genes? Well, there's two of them. There's BRCA1 and BRCA2. They are known as the breast and or ovarian cancer susceptibility genes. They are tumor suppressor genes, which means when functioning properly and expressed, these genes and all tumor suppressor genes control cell growth. So tumor suppressor genes are good, they promote health, and their gene products, the proteins they encode, keep cell division under control. When tumor suppressor genes are mutated, and those proteins either are not made or are made in a non-functioning form, then we see cell proliferation become uncontrolled and rise, and that increase in cellular proliferation is what gives rise to the tumor. We'll come back in just a moment uh, and talk about tumor suppressor genes and their genetics a little bit more generally, along with oncogenes, but that's what we mean here. When the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes are functioning properly and making the correct proteins, they should keep cell proliferation down. And indeed, that's what they do. They regulate the cell cycle. They keep the cycle of cell division moderated, modulated, and keep cells from growing too quickly and proliferating in an uncontrolled way. Specifically, these gene products, the proteins from BRCA1 and BRCA2, inhibit the growth of cells that line the milk ducts of the breast, and with those genes mutated and without having those proper proteins, these milk duct cells begin proliferating and can give rise to tumors. As we'll see in just a second as well, these gene products, the proteins encoded by BRCA1 and BRCA2, are also involved in controlling DNA replication, more specifically in DNA damage repair, specifically double strand breaks in DNA, which give rise to secondary accumulated mutations. So, as promised, if we take a step back from the BRCA gene specifically and think a little bit more generally about tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes and also roll into that our understanding of Mendelian genetics, we can begin to piece together why tumor suppressor genes are slightly redundant and also the mutations in them tend to be recessive, whereas mutations in oncogenes that promote cancer tend to be dominant. So what we see here is a normal cell with two normal chromosomes, two unmutated alleles in those chromosomes. And we can, of course, pick up a random mutation either due to a DNA replication error, as we would call that a spontaneous mutation, or an induced mutation uh, due to the environment. We pick up a mutation in one of these alleles, and now, because of that one mutation, this cell now has a greater prolifer proliferation and can give rise to a tumor. So this individual right here is heterozygotic. They've got one mutated allele and one normal allele. And in the heterozygous condition, they are showing the phenotype of cancer, a lack of health. That means this mutation is dominant because it is stronger than the other allele. And we are seeing a new phenotype due to the presence of one mutation. That's the characteristic of oncogenes. Oncogenes promote cancer, uh, and they are dominant. The Only one oncogene mutated 
will give you a cancerous phenotype. Tumor suppressor genes work the other way. Since tumor suppressor genes should be on, and the gene products from tumor suppressor genes like BRCA1 and BRCA2 are helpful and keep cell proliferation under control, we can actually tolerate a random mutation of one of those alleles. So here again, we've picked up a mutation in a tumor suppressor allele. We are heterozygous now. We've got one wild type allele that's functional and one mutant tumor suppressor allele that is non-functional. And what we see is no effect. This cell is still non-proliferative. This cell is still healthy because mutations to tum tumor suppressor genes are recessive. They are non-functional mutations, whereas oncogene mutations are gain-of-function mutations. In order for this cell to become tumorous, we actually need a second mutation in the second allele, and we need to be homozygous recessive. The only way here to show the recessive phenotype of cancer is to be homozygous recessive for two non-functioning tumor suppressor alleles. So tumor suppressor mutations that lead to cancer tend to be recessive, and tumor, and, uh, tumor promoting mutations that tend to be dominant are oncogenes. This also explains how we can see being born with a predisposition to cancer, right? It is possible for an individual to be born healthy with this genotype, their heterozygous, and they only have one functional tumor suppressor gene allele. That individual essentially has one strike against them. They're already operating on only one functional tumor suppressor allele, and if they pick up a random mutation in that allele, then they will develop tumors. And this is the genetic basis of cancer predisposition. So going back to the BRCA genes, talk about the BRCA proteins just a bit. Uh, first, the protein that's encoded by the BRCA1 gene consists of 1,863 amino acids. It is expressed in most cells that are proliferative, even healthy cells that are proliferative uh, for a reason. We see this product expressed. It tends to be part of a much larger protein complex, which we'll touch on in just a moment, and it's a big protein. It's 3 megadaltons, 3,000 kilodaltons in size. Its characteristic feature is a BRCT domain. Uh, this is the C-terminal region of the Branca protein. And in fact, it has two of those BRCT domains, or repeats. And we can see the crystal structure there in the upper right of these domains. A really beautiful structure, very, very helical. There's also on the N-terminal end of the protein a ring finger domain, which is used for protein-protein interaction. And one of the proteins that BRCA1 associates with often is called BARD1, and we'll see that uh, briefly in just a moment as well. Most BRCA1 mutations are germline mutations, meaning the parent of the individual harboring the mutant allele picked up that mutation in their gametogenesis, either in the production of their sperm or of their eggs. Uh, so they typically don't run in families. They, they are more germline. And again, as we just said, for tumor suppressor genes, being heterozygous for a BRCA1 mutation, just as being heterozygous for any tumor suppressor allele, will give you a predisposition for cancer and has a higher likelihood of developing cancer. And of course, higher likelihood also translates to an earlier onset in life because we're all accumulating mutations as we go through our day. To put some numbers on it, individuals who are carriers for a BRCA1 mutation who are heterozygous for BRCA1 have an 80% increased risk of breast cancer. So it makes a big, big difference. This is why a number of years ago, Angelina Jolie elected to have a double mastectomy, although she had no cancers, because she had the BRCA1 and BRCA2 heterozygosity, and her increased risk for cancer was in the mid-90%. So there's some degree of certainty that if she lived long enough, she would develop breast and or ovarian cancer, and she elected to remove that tissue to avoid that risk. And again, we do see a, a correlation with ovarian cancer as well. The BRCA2 protein is also large. It consists of 3,418 amino acids. This is uh, the functional domain of the BRCA2 protein crystallized here. 385 kilodaltons. It's characterized by having one of the longer exons in our genome. Exon 11 of this gene is very, very long. And it encodes, that exon, the peptide motifs for interacting with RAD51. RAD51, all the RAD proteins, in fact, are big players in DNA repair. Uh, in fact, RAD stands for radiation damage. So these are proteins that are commonly involved in fixing mutations and double-strand breaks. So to show that mechanism, here we have a double-strand break in the DNA. We've broken the backbone of DNA in two spots, two phosphodiester bond breakages very close to each other. 
And first what we see is what's called resection. Some of one strand is chewed away on both of those halves, leaving a single-stranded molecule behind. And that single-stranded molecule is usually bound by some kind of single-stranded binding protein. Here it's RPA. And then after that, that RPA is recruiting BRCA2 and RAD51. So RAD51 and BRCA2 are recruited to this site of double-strand break together because of that resection, because of that uh, chewed away single-stranded DNA. And then BRCA2 along with RAD53. RAD53 functionally, but RAD50, uh, RAD51, excuse me, RAD51 is functionally involved in the repair, but it's recruited by BRCA2 we see the resolution of this double strand break. So the double strand break is repaired. So clearly, if BRCA2 is involved in recruiting RAD51 to double strand breaks, and RAD51 is the repairer of those breaks, then if we have mutations in BRCA2, we're going to have a great many double strand breaks that are not repaired, and that's going to give rise to chromosomal instability and greater mutations. Cancer at its heart is a disease of accumulated mutations, so anything that predisposes us for not repairing mutations is going to lead to increased cancer risk simply because we accumulate mutations at a greater rate without those repair proteins pro present. So BRCA2 mutations have similar increased risk of cancer as what we see for BRCA1 in the heterozygous state. Uh, but the age of onset in BRCA2 mutations tends to be a little bit later, and that's likely because we have redundant mechanisms in place, crude mechanisms, but redundant mechanisms for repairing double-strand breaks. However, what distinguishes BRCA2 mutations is that it gives rise to other cancers in addition to just breast cancer, and these are cancers that can be found in both males and females, and they include gastric cancer, colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, of course, specific to uh, XYs, and melanoma. And we can also have breast cancer in biological males and in individuals that have an X and a Y chromosome, and that breast cancer is often highly correlated with BRCA2 mutations as well. So we've touched a little bit on what the BRCA proteins do, but to expand on that, we've already seen that the BRCA proteins are involved in double strand break repair, and part of the mechanism for repairing double strand breaks is a process called homologous recombination. And again, to emphasize that here and to show BRCA1's role in that, because we just highlighted BRCA2, we get the double strand break, usually due to ionizing radiation or some high energy exposure. That's going to lead to the destruction of an FA core complex through ubiquitin elation, and that's going to trigger this repair mechanism. A protein called ATM is going to, as a kinase, phosphorylate some target proteins, including CHECK2. CHECK2 triggers the actual repair mechanism. ATM also phosphorylates this RAD50 complex. The RAD50 is going to work directly on the DNA and prepare it for repair. And the CHECK2 targets, those proteins phosphorylated by the kinase CHECK2, are going to cause the repair to happen. And look who is in this complex. We've got BRCA2 with RAD51. We've already seen them. But also co-localizing to the breakpoint is BRCA1 and BARD1. So all of these proteins together are going to be recruited to this double strand break, and they will work with RAD50 to repair that break. And with the repair done and the double strand break fixed, uh, we have a much lower incident of other mutations in that area and of gene loss in that area. So we see that other proteins are involved in this process. In, in fact, in order to kickstart this double strand break repair, we actually see a um, histone uh, de uh, variant, not HTZ, that not H2AZ, which we talked about in that paper earlier on in the semester, but H2AX, another and distinct variant of histone H2A. We also see RAD51. RAD51 is a big player in this, and P53, which you may have heard of in other classes. Uh, P53 actually halts the cell cycle, pauses the cell in the cell cycle when it senses DNA damage and it gives the cell a chance to repair that damage. So P53 essentially puts a hold on all other cellular processes so that pathways like this can actually occur. And what are the effects of the BRCA proteins in DNA damage? Well, when we have mutations to the BRCA genes, we lose that P53 pause. That P53 checkpoint that gives the cell time to make those repairs is lost in BRCA mutations. P53, again, is a gene that encodes a regulatory protein that is activated during DNA damage, gives the cell a chance to fix that damage. 
and it's believed that this connection between p53 and the BRCA proteins is due to mutations occurring in those BRCT domains. Those are the domains that help BRCA uh, co-localize to these DNA damage points and become part of the complexes that they belong to. So after DNA damage, the first thing that happens is this histone variant, H2AX, becomes phosphorylated and forms these foci at the break site. And again, that's how the cell recognizes that there's damage in that region, this phosphorylation of H2AX. Then BRCA2 is recruited to that site. It's also phosphorylated, and that marks that site. I'm sorry, BRCA1 is recruited, and that marks that site as damaged. And once we have marked that site as damaged, we can initiate repair. So the chromatin in that local area is changed uh, covalently, post-translational modifications, so the histone code marks that region as needing repair. And then we can begin to recruit the other players for the repair, like we talked about in just a moment ago. RAD51 comes in with BRCA2 after that RPA, a single-strand binding protein comes in, and we can initiate the repair. Uh, these BCR repeats on BRCA2, part again of that exon 11, is what allows the protein-protein interaction with RAD51, and so BRCA2 and RAD51 co-localize there at the break site. These repeats allow uh, RAD51 to form along that break site and bind to that single-stranded DNA, and again, that's what we're trying to emphasize here. RAD51 is interacting with these uh, BRCT domains, so we get lots of RAD51 at the break site, and we've recognized the break site due to resection, and, and we can make that repair. So if we bring this all together into a cascade, we have a double strand break. Double strand break is immediately recognized by H2AX phosphorylation. That's the cell's way of flagging that site as needing repair. BRCA1 is then recruited to phosphorylated H2AX and begins to establish that as a region needing repair. After that and resection, we can recruit BRCA2 and RAD51, and these will be the repair enzymes that restore the double-strand break back to a contiguous DNA molecule, contiguous chromosome, and we do so without losing all that much genetic information. RAD51 can be brought to double-strand breaks without BRCA2, but it doesn't do so correctly, and we do get some gene loss. We typically lose nucleotides at the break site. We'll have some chromosomal errors, and again, that'll lead to mutations in the cell. And as we accumulate these kinds of mutations, we accumulate our risk of cancer. So in the absence of BRCA2, cells mutate at a much, much higher rate. And in doing so, we run the risk of getting uh, cancer-promoting mutations to genes that are um, usually silenced and keep us cancer-free. So, a predisposition of cancer born by mutations in proteins, or genes for proteins, that are involved in DNA repair. It's an indirect mechanism, right? The only outcome of these BRCA mutations is that the mutation rate goes up. Cells have a harder time repairing DNA damage. The BRCA genes don't cause mutations. Uh, I'm sorry, the BRCA genes don't cause cancer. The BRCA genes cause a higher rate of mutation. But as we build up more and more mutations in more and more cells, we have an increased risk of having a specific set of mutations in a specific set of genes that gives rise to a cancerous cell. So predisposition of cancer due to a faster accumulation of mutations in BRCA mutants. To switch gears now and to talk about alcoholism, and this will be the focus of our paper this week as well, we first have to talk a little bit about what addiction is neurobiologically. The region of the brain that's responsible for pleasure is the nucleus accumbens. This is the pleasure center of the brain, and it seems to play a role in addiction. But that's counterintuitive, right? Because when you think of addicts, you don't think of pleasure. Gamblers are rarely smiling as they gamble. Addicts don't often enjoy abusing the drug of their choice. Uh, even working hard and having that reward of a hard day's work doesn't really make us joyful. So we have to question that antiquated notion of the nucleus accumbens being the pleasure center of the brain. And in fact, it makes more sense to think of the nucleus accumbens as the want center of the brain. Pleasure and want are two different things, right? It feels good to scratch an itch, to scratch a mosquito bite, but that's not real pleasure. That's giving in to the want, to the urge of scratching. So this is pleasure, right? Enjoying a donut. And this is want. And it's a completely different thing. 
So developing an addiction is more increasing how much you want something than it is how much you like it. Again, addicts are typically joyful, but they are scratching the itch of their want. Mice with increased dopamine signaling in the nucleus accumbens have shown that they want more food. And if you decrease dopamine signaling in the nucleus accumbens, those mice want food less. But there are ways that we can measure preference for food, and we see that whether or not the nucleus accumbens is being triggered by dopamine or under-triggered by low dopamine levels, those mice want, uh, enjoy food the same amount. They prefer foods the same amount, but they want food more or less. So dopamine seems to be the neurotransmitter involved in addiction, and dopamine is known to be the reward neurotransmitter. So every time we do something good that promotes our well-being, we get a little bit of dopamine released on the nucleus accumbens, and that's our brain's way of self-fortifying and saying, that was good, do that again. Uh, that was pleasurable. Do that again. That's reward. And so the way that the brain trains itself to do things that are good is by uh, allowing dopamine to squirt itself onto the nucleus accumbens. Now, sugar is a perfect example of this, right? Sugar is the easiest to use carbon source. It is easily met a uh, can be metabolized very easily, it takes very little energy to get the energy out of sugar. It's a low investment nutri uh, nutrition source. So eating sugar is good from an evolutionary point of view. Sugar is quite rare in the wild. And so if you find sugar, you should eat it. You should make use of that uh, easy source of energy because you might not find another one anytime soon. So when we consume sugar, Dopamine is released in our nucleus accumbens, and we get that reward that makes us feel good. Again, that idea of a pleasure center. But the net result of that is we want sugar again, right? We are driven to consume sugar. Now, in the natural world, in the wild, that's a great thing because, again, sugar is rare, and we should be consuming it every time we find it. We can store it for energy later uh, if we happen to run into starvation or, or uh, instances of low nutrition. However, in our non-natural environment now, where sugar is so plentiful, getting that dopamine hit is not a good thing because we can have more sugar and more sugar. We consume higher and higher levels of sugar, and our health goes down as a result. So addiction is really this reward system, which has an evolutionary advantage, gone haywire. And instead of rewarding positive behaviors, we're actually rewarding negative behaviors because of the artificial social context that we've created for ourselves. So what we see observed at the nuclear commons is that it can become sensitized when an addiction is forming. In other words, it responds more strongly to the addiction. That sugar is good, that alcohol is good, that gambling is good, and it gives an overemphasized reward to our, uh, to our neuro neurology. Repeated use of cocaine is a good example of this. It increases the ability to release dopamine, that reward sensation in the nucleus accumbens and its ability to drive seeking behaviors by the prefrontal cortex. So you begin to concentrate on getting cocaine, focusing on getting cocaine. You're driven to have that next dopamine hit, and that dopamine hit is coming from cocaine abuse. However, the most potent learning for addiction seems to be not the pleasure, but the pain, the withdrawal. Once withdrawal comes on, even if it's earliest barely recognized forms, it is quickly alleviated by the use of the drug, and that is a self-fulfilling behavior. This is a very potent reinforcement that drives addiction. So from the alcoholic point of view, when I drink, I feel good, right? Dopamine is released, and my brain is telling me that was a good thing to do. So drinking is good, right? That, that's how I feel. But then refortifying the other side, because I'm getting social cues that drinking this much is bad. I'm getting social cues that maybe I'm engaging in a destructive behavior, so I abstain for a few days and I start to feel like crap. That's the withdrawal. But when I drink again, I don't feel like crap anymore. I feel better. And that self-reinforcing pathway, you learn to drink in a hurry and that becomes an addiction quite readily. So alcoholism is the continued use of alcohol despite medical or social harm, even after people have decided to quit or decrease their drinking. There's nothing here about being arrested for DUI. There's nothing here about 12 beers a night. It really comes down to, is the alcohol use detrimental socially or medically? And, or, can you stop when you want to? 
If the answer to the first question is yes, or the answer to the question's, second question is no, then you fit the definition for alcoholism. So again, being an alcoholic does not require a severe deterioration of life, uh, either health or socially. It just requires this inability to control one's own actions or having a negative consequence on their life. So how does alcohol work? Well, it's an inhibit inhibitory molecule. It decreases the flow of sodium across the cell membrane, that quiet cell's ability to communicate with each other. It decreases serotonin activity, which is our alertness neurotransmitter. It facilitates the response of GABA receptors. GABA receptors tend to be inhibitory. It blocks glutamate receptors. Glutamate receptors tend to be excitatory. So all of these things are inhibitory. Alcohol inhibits a lot of our neurological activity. And insidiously, it increases dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens. If alcohol did everything except to the dopamine release, it would quiet us, it would inhibit us, it would have that dulling quality, but it would likely be not nearly as addictive. But unfortunately, when alcohol is consumed, dopamine is released, and we're fooling our brain into saying that was a good thing, that behavior was, was evolutionarily advantageous, and so we're driven to do it again. So we know now that there is a strong genetic basis for early onset alcoholism, especially in men, individuals with XY chromosomes. This is termed type 2 or type B alcoholism. Uh, type B alcoholism, again, earlier onset, so usually there's trouble drinking before the age of 25. More rapid onset, so from the first drink to a problem, tends to be a shorter window of time. It is more genetic, so it tends to have a stronger family history. More prevalent in biological males, and it's often very severe, a difficult time of recovery, and uh, often we see alcohol driving individuals to criminal behaviors. Type 1 or type A alcoholism usually comes on later in life. People struggle with this, uh, this addiction after 25 years old. There's usually a much longer window between the first exposure to alcohol and the actual addiction. There's fewer relatives battling alcoholism for type 1. Men and women seem to encounter this about equally, and it's generally a less severe alcoholism that's easier to recover from and drives people to less extreme behaviors. Part of the way that we know that there seems to be a genetic component in type B alcoholism is by twin studies, twin concordance studies. And to sum it up, monozygotic twins have a greater concordance for alcoholism than dizygotic twins. We'll come back to twin concordance in just a moment. Also, adopted children have an increased risk for alcoholism if their biological parents were alcoholics versus their adoptive parents. Classic way to determine nature versus nurture. If it was somebody's environment that was causing them to drink, then it would be the home they've grown up in, the school they went to, the friends they had, the parents they had. But no, we seem to see a greater increase of alcoholism, especially type B alcoholism, if the parents were alcoholic, the biological parents who are not even in the picture, which shows a genetic predisposition. But of course, environment certainly plays a role too. Uh, Specifically, if a woman who is pregnant consumes alcohol, considerable amounts of alcohol, there's a significantly greater chance that her child will be an alcoholic when they grow up. Sons of alcoholics do show less than average intoxication from drinking. They have a higher tolerance, um, so that works against them. Typically, they need to drink more to have the same effect, so this leads to excessive drinking earlier on in life. Again, if you have sons of alcoholic fathers, there'll be a greater number of those sons who are alcoholics themselves versus young men who don't have an alcoholic father. And if you test each man's uh, resistance to alcohol, you can often find that the son of an alcoholic has this greater tolerance. And if you check back with them years and years later, a much larger number of those sons of alcoholics who had the greater tolerance are themselves now alcoholics as well versus a control group where there was a mean level of intoxication, uh, mean level of tolerance, and a much lower number of alcoholics later on in life because there's no alcoholism in the paternal lineage. Sons of alcoholics who are less susceptible to the effects of alcohol, who again have this higher tolerance, have a greater chance of being alcoholics by 60%. So this is truly a significant predisposition. And they also show stress drinking. So Alcoholic consumption does decrease stress, but it does so more for sons of alcoholics than average individuals. And also, uh, the amygdala, which is the emotional regulator of the brain, 
tends to be smaller in the sons of alcoholics, which show that they have a less reduced, they have a reduced capacity for dealing with emotional trauma and emotional stress and are likely using alcohol to self-medicate that. Now, there are ways to intervene despite all of these genetic challenges. Uh, many addicts who genuinely want to quit but lack the willpower to, they, they do have some therapeutics available to assist that. Ant abuse is a drug specifically for alcoholism. It antagonizes an enzyme that converts some of the toxic byproducts of alcohol to harmless ones. So this enzyme clears our system of alcohol byproducts quickly. But this drug, ant abuse, inhibits that enzyme. So in other words, we start to build up toxic byproducts of alcoholism uh, after we've taken this drug. So if an addict takes ant abuse and then drinks, they become violently ill, like food poisoning ill, because they accumulate these toxic byproducts. It's short term, there's no permanent damage, uh, but it does make them extremely uncomfortable. So the idea here is if you genuinely want to quit drinking, but you can't control your behaviors, you can, in a moment of strength, take this one pill, ant abuse, and then you know that if you drink that night, it is going to be awful, right? So it's a strong negative incentive to not drink uh, that way that because you know how sick you're going to be. Now, it's true, an addict can always decide to not take the pill and then drink that whole night because it is the taking of the pill, having the ant abuse that gives rise to this. But again, the idea here is, you know, if in the morning you're committed, if you have that resolve to say, I am not going to drink today, you can take the pill that morning. And then as your resolve dissipates and you want to cave later on in the day, you have this external pressure letting you know that if you drink, it's going to be a rough, rough night. And so uh, many alcoholics who genuinely want to stop but struggle early to have that level of discipline and willpower find ant abuse to be quite successful. All right, so we've heard of twin concordance a number of different times in this last unit. It came up when we were talking about cystic fibrosis. It was in the paper that we read for that week. Here it is again in our uh, alcoholism discussion. So let's talk a little bit about twin concordance studies specifically so that by the end of the course here, we have some understanding of how we can do genetic analyses in the human species without having to do uh, true experimentation. So as you probably know, there are two types of t twins. We typically refer to them as identical or fraternal. Dizygotic twins is the biological term for fraternal twins. This is when two different zygotes form independently. Two eggs, released by the mother, are fertilized by two different sperm, given by the father, and so we have two different individuals. Dizygotic twins are no more or less related to one another than just siblings. Siblings are two different eggs and two different sperm, and dizygotic twins are the same. It's just that dizygotic twins were in the uterus at the same exact time and grew up in the household at the same exact time. The other is monozygotic twins. Monozygotic meaning from one zygote, and these are identical twins. One egg is fertilized by one sperm, and then very early on in development, that egg splits, giving rise to two separate individuals who are genetic clones of one another. They have the same exact DNA. So as we already said, dizygotic twins are two different eggs uh, fertilized by two different sperm. So they are siblings. They have an average DNA relatedness of about 50%, but we range anywhere typically from 25% DNA similarity to 75% DNA similarity in fraternal twins and all siblings for that, example, for that matter. And then monozygotic twins is one egg and one sperm that split early on. And so we have two genetic clones. They are truly genetically identical. And this just diagrams that as a schematic. Two different egg, two different sperm versus one egg and one sperm. So we can think about this as dizygotic twins, fraternal twins, really only having nurture in common, right? They were in the uterus at the same time. So if the mother drank when she was pregnant, she exposed them both. If the mother got the flu when she was pregnant, they were both exposed. If the family lived under high tension power lines, both kids grew up in that house. If there was an abusive parent, they were both abused, right? So they're growing up in the same environment. They have the same nurture. However, identical twins have all that as well. Same uterus, same upbringing, same home, same school, same family. But identical twins also have exactly the same DNA. So if we subtract the dizygotic twins, which is environment, 
from the monozygotic twins, which is environment and genes, we're left with genes, right? Genes and environment minus environment equals genes. And that's how we use twin studies to kind of get at the genetic component. So, so how do we do that? We do that through something called concordance. Concordance is what percentage of twin pairs have the same version of the trait. By comparing traits in mono and dizygotic twins, we can begin to parse out the genetic component of a trait. If twins show the same trait in the same way, then we have a concordance. And what I mean by that is if both twins of the twin pair are right-handed, we have concordance. And if both twins in a twin pair are left-handed, we have concordance. So again, concordance is when the twins in the twin pair match each other for the phenotype. A lack of concordance is when one twin is right-handed and one twin is left-handed. If dizygotic twins have a high level of concordance, then it's very likely that trait has a strong environmental component because dizygotic twins are not very in, uh, genetically identical. Remember, they're just siblings. They could be as much as 75% genetically different. However, if twin pairs in dizygotic twins very commonly match for a trait, then it's likely because they were in the same uterus at the same time. They were in the same house at the same time. They had the same schools, right? It's an environmental effect. Again, dizygotic twins are only about 50% the same, but they are often 100% the same environmentally. If we see high concordance in monozygotic twins, so monozygotic twins are much more alike. They're both right-handed. They're both left-handed. They're rarely opposite then that's likely a strong genetic component because the only thing monozygotic twins have that's completely identical is their genes. So if we have high concordance in the monos and lower concordance in the dyes, the only difference between dizygotic twins and monozygotic twins is that genetic identity. So again, concordance is the percent of time that two members of the twin pair match for that trait. And if there's a higher concordance in identical twins, Identical twins share the same genetics and the same environment. And there's a lower concordance in dizygotic twins, which only have environment the same, then we're likely looking at a genetic trait. So this is a very typical twin concordance table, right? We've got some traits here, some uh, syndromes, and then we've got concordance for monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins. So let's go to epilepsy as a good example. So in epilepsy, we have 59% concordance in monozygotic twins. What does that mean? That means in 59% of the twin pairs studied, either both twins had epilepsy or both twins did not have epilepsy. The other 41% of the twin pairs, one had epilepsy and one didn't on the monozygotic twin. For the dizygotic twins, that concordance in twin pairs was 19%. So again, 19% of the dizygotic twins, either both twins had epilepsy or both twins didn't. And the other 81% of the twins was one had it and one didn't. So when we look at the dizygotic twins, they're having a nearly identical environment. And that's probably explaining this 19% concordance. The monozygotic twins also have nearly identical environment, but they also have identical genetics. So if we subtract this concordance from this one, we're left with an additional 40% concordance or 40% matching that can only be attributed to the genetics. And that's a strong genetic component. If we look at a trait like heart attack in males, we see a less dramatic spread between the mono and dizygotic concordance, right? If we subtract 26 from 39, we've only got 13. That means 13% of the concordance in heart attack in males can be attributed exclusively to genetics. The rest is likely environmental. So by comparing mono and dizygotic concordances in this way, we can start to parse out what's likely environmental and what's likely genetic. So sometimes there's struggle with this. Let me know at the end of the lecture. We can certainly review this on Friday. But this is a really powerful way to uh, get at human environmental and genetic traits. Now, it's not perfect, right? For any of you that know twins or maybe you're a part of an identical twin pair, you'll know that despite the same environment and the same genetics, there's a lot of variation and differences between these in individuals. And oftentimes, twin pairs will intentionally separate their environments and try to, you know, uh, achieve a sense of self and a unique identity. 
And are the environments of mono and dizygotic twins truly identical? Right? Is it possible for us to say that every single thing that happened to one happened to the other? It's not. So this is not a perfect science. This is, by no means is this unequivocal. But it has given us a great deal of information and allowed us to scratch the surface of what might be environmental versus what might be genetic for a lot of traits that it has been used to study. So let's use a twin concordance study of asthma as an example. We all know what asthma is, I believe, a constriction of the airways that makes it difficult for individuals to breathe. Um, asthma rates in children have been climbing at an alarming rate as of late. And of course, it makes sense to say that that's due to pollution, that's due to the poisoning of the air, the, the you know contamination of the earth, for sure, and, and all an environmental cause. But how are we certain? Scientists in the UK not too long ago studied 5,000 twin pairs, mono and dizygotic twin pairs, to look at concordance in asthma. And this is what they found. So the concordance in monozygotic twins is 65%. Again, to define that, in 65% of the twin pairs that they looked, by, looked at, and again, they looked at a lot, if one twin had the asthma, the other one did too, or if one twin didn't have asthma, the other didn't either. 65% of the time that happened. And the other 35% of the time, uh, one twin had asthma and one didn't. When they did the same study for dizygotic twins, <clears throat> excuse me, there was only 37% concordance. So we can look at this two ways. There's definitely a genetic component to asthma, right? We've got a differential in the concordance of 28%. So there definitely seems to be a genetic component. If you are a twin and your genes are identical, you've got a much higher rate of matching your twin pair than simply being fraternal twins with different genetics. But the environment plays a role too, because if this was purely genetic, then we would expect the concordance in monozygotic twins to be 100%, right? If it was, again, like being able to roll your tongue, then the concordance is 100%. If one twin can roll their tongue, the other can too. If one twin can't, the other can't either. 100% concordance for traits that are purely genetic. Uh, so there is room for an environmental effect here. So those who are blaming the environment for higher rates of asthma have some credence to do so. And those who are saying that there must be some predisposition for asthma, some genetic component, and there's evidence for that as well. So let's see how much sense this does make to us. Here's a, a concept check. So a trait exhibits 100% concordance for both mono and dizygotic twins. What conclusions can you draw about the role of genetic factors in determining the differences in that trait? And is it extremely important? The genetics somewhat important, not important, or is it both genetics and the environment that are uh, playing a role there? So let's see what you think about that. All right, so we can move on to fetal ketonuria now. Um, this is an example of how the environment and the genetics work together and interplay to manifest traits. Uh, fetal ketonuria is typically referred to as PKU, and it is inherited as an autosomal recessive trait. It is a metabolic disorder caused by a deficiency of the liver enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase, and it prevents, the mutation prevents the normal metabolism of the phenylalanine amino acid. So phenylalanine hydroxylase converts phenylalanine to tyrosine, that's its job, and then tyrosine is used as a precursor for a lot of different biomolecules, and tyrosine can be easily broken down as well uh, and secreted. So individuals with PKU, individuals who lack a functional phenylalanine hydroxylase, can't convert phenylalanine to tyrosine, and so phenylalanine builds up to toxic levels in their cells and ultimately can cause uh, severe cognitive decline, cognitive um, phenotypes. So the PKU gene is found on chromosome 12, on the Q arm of chromosome 12. Its little address there on the chromosome is 24.1. Uh, so that puts it squarely in this region of the chromosome on the long arm. And again, that's where the phenylalanine hydroxylase gene lives. High levels in phenylalanine is the first indicator that there's an inability to process the amino acid and that the individual might be at risk of building up toxic levels and having permanent damage done. For this reason, infants are tested very, very quickly after birth to make sure that one, their phenylalanine levels are normal, and two, to test their genetics for the mutant allele. Uh, we can intervene right away and reduce phenylalanine consumption and therefore block the ability of toxic levels to form and really avoid this cognitive uh, impact. But we need to act very quickly for the newborn baby. And 
Even now, the only treatment for PKU is a low phenylalanine diet. If we keep phenylalanine levels low, such that the only phenylalanine we consume is used directly through recycling to build our own proteins, and no additional phenylalanine needs to be metabolized, then we can uh, block this toxic buildup. Unfortunately, however, lots of foods that are part of our normal diet are high in phenylalanine, such as meat, fish, dairy products, legumes, bread, all have high phenylalanine, so the diet is quite restrictive. But again, if we catch PKU early and we do implement that restrictive diet, individuals will have a very normal life other than the diet that they have to follow. Uh, no risk of mental decline, no risk of cognitive impairment, and uh, they can live a full life. Artificial protein substitutes is basically how individuals make up their amino acid uh, consumption, just making sure that phenylalanine is not present. Here are some examples of that. There's uh, PKU Low Flex, which is kind of a fruit shake, and there are also these powdered blends that individuals can dissolve. Again, of high levels of amino acids in both of these, but specifically phenylalanine free or phenylalanine low, so that individuals can get their protein consumption, but they avoid their phenylalanine intake. And oftentimes, uh, I found this in my research for the lecture, but, you know, Halloween is a special time for all kids. PKU kid most likely wants to engage in Halloween, but obviously doesn't want to be at risk. And so text is too small to see, I know, but this is a guide for the different kinds of candy brands and candy varieties that are either phenylalanine free, phenylalanine low, or should be avoided because they're high in phenylalanine. Again, it's autosomal recessive. It's got a very low prevalence in our um, population, so 0.005%. So what is that? That's uh, 5 in 1,000. But 1.5% uh, of the population is carrier for PKU. So, you know, small in number and rare, but certainly common enough that we want to, as a society, make accommodations for PKU and make sure that individuals with phenylketonuria uh, have what they need in order to live healthy lives. So, that is the last lecture. Uh, just to summarize what we discussed, BRCA1 and BRCA2 collectively are the breast and ovarian cancer susceptibility genes. They are tumor suppressor genes. When active and expressed, they keep us safe and keep us protected from cancer. Individuals who are heterozygous carriers for BRCA1 have an 80% risk of breast cancer, and those numbers are just slightly lower for BRCA2 heterozygosity. BRCA2 encodes a peptide so that it can interact with RAD51, and that's involved in DNA double-strand break repair. BRCA2 mutations also confer a higher risk of breast cancer in males, as well as a wide array of other cancers that we talked about in the lecture. BRCA proteins are involved in homologous recombination, which is also part of double-strand break repair, so that DNA damage can be dealt with efficiently and not lead to an accumulation of mutations. More specifically, on a double-strand break, H2AX becomes phosphorylated and recruits BRCA1, and we can get repair through that way. Moving on to addiction, the nucleus accumbens is technically the pleasure center of the brain. Makes more sense to think of it as the want center of the brain, but it is evolved in addiction. In addiction is increasing how much you want something, not how much you like it, and there is a strong genetic basis for early onset type B alcoholism in men. Sons of alcoholics show less intoxication. They have a higher tolerance, which likely leads to excessive drinking. And they are also less susceptible to the effects of alcohol and have a greater chance of becoming alcoholic. And then we talked about concordance in general. Concordance is the percentage of twin pairs that match one another, monozygotic twins or dizygotic twins. If there's a higher concordance in identical twins than in di, we're probably looking at some level of a genetic influence. And finally, we talked about PKU. Phenylalanine hydroxylase is the enzyme that converts phenylalanine to tyrosine so that it can be metabolized and cleared from the body. Individuals with PKU don't have this functional enzyme, so they cannot do that conversion, and this leads to toxic levels of phenylalanine building up and causes cognitive issues. The only treatment available at this point is a low phenylalanine diet uh, where those toxic levels are avoided and the individual can live a very normal life outside of the restrictive diet that they have to engage in. So, believe it or not, as far as new learning and content goes, that's it. What a wonderful semester. I truly hope you enjoyed these lectures, and I look forward to wrapping this course up with all of you 
this week as we review this information and next week as I hear from all of you the wonderful research that you've been doing on genetic disorders of your own. So until I see you on Friday, thanks so much for watching.